Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading, and this is an original 1760s swivel breech flintlock rifle. J. Ernst Fielder was active in Ulm around 1760 per Der New Stockel. This combination gun has an octagon barrel with seven groove rifling and a blade and notch sight system and a part octagon, part round barrel with a smooth bore and silver spider blade front sight. Both barrels are signed J. Ernst Fielder in Um in silver inlay with some accents. The various components have some simple engraving. The gun is equipped with an adjustable double set trigger and the buttstock has a checkered wrist and large cheek piece. This swivel breech has been reconverted back to a flintlock configuration. Both the rifle and smoothbore barrel measure at 58 caliber and the barrels are 31 and 1 8 inch long. For those of you unfamiliar, the swivel breech action is set up to use one lock to operate both barrels here with a swivel or pivot point here just forward of the lock. To demonstrate real quick how this swivel breech assembly works, say we've shot out of our smooth bore barrel here on the top, we'll set our cock back to half cock. We have a release for the swivel on the front bow of our trigger guard. We will depress, rotate the barrel assembly around, it locks into place, we can set our cock to full cock, and we're ready to take our second shot. This is one of the earlier methods that we have to get multi shots out of a flintlock or a muzzle loading rifle in general here. Again, these actions and these assemblies can be very finicky. Even contemporary makers at times will have issues with them. Thankfully, in the modern era, we do have modern machining that makes the assembly and creation of these actions much easier to do more so than sawing and, and cutting these out uh, in your blacksmith shop or your you know more traditional gunsmith shop for the 18th century. Starting at the butt and working our way forward, we have a brass butt plate here held on with a couple flathead screws. We have some ornate finial work on the top of our butt plate here, and we have simple border engraving. It's kind of accenting the shape of the butt stock with some attempts here at some simple scroll engraving on either side. Our patch box here is a sliding wood patch box with a simple spring release, like we see on many American long rifles for the same era. We just have a simple spring coming back through here and our patch box lid is dovetailed to slide into the stock. The back face of our patch box lid here is faced in brass with two small screws. We have a fairly large rectangular patch box here. It's unfinished internally, so we don't have any stain or oil in here. This is very much raw wood, which I like to see. And many times in contemporary building, we think about needing to stain and protect all the internals of our long rifles. But in many cases, the originals did not have any finish on these internal areas. And that would include the internals of our lock inlets, our barrel channel, and maybe even under our nose cap as for example on this rifle. Those areas that aren't going to be seen usually aren't coated or protected in any way. On the underside we have a flat toe on this combination rifle here. No protective toe plate back here towards the buttstock. The trigger guard on this piece looks and, and matches with silhouettes of the same era but our front bow here is separated. As noted in the demonstration of the swivel breech, this is our primary release for our ability to swivel and rotate the barrel. It is mounted at the front of the trigger guard to the stock and releases some kind of pin or catch that locks the barrels in place. Coming up here a little bit, this is something that's gonna be common across swivel breeches of many eras and many stylings. We have our flintlock cock here. In a traditional flintlock rifle, much of the lock internals would be set just internal to the cock and maybe somewhat forward. On this, however, because we have this rotating barrel assembly, all of these lock internals have to be pushed back here to the back. So we have a bit of a back action lock here for this flint lock because those internals are placed behind this lock plate into the wrist. The entire frizzen assembly and the touch holes are included in each swiveling barrel. So each barrel has their own frizzen, pan, and touch hole. Coming to the top of the stock here, even though it's not necessary except to hold the trigger plate in, we do have our barrel tang coming across here, although it's not actually connected to either barrel. Internally, we'd find some kind of rod or pivot pin that these barrels would rotate on going back into the stock. Currently, our smoothbore barrel is here on the top. It starts out as an octagon, goes down about a third of the barrel before terminating 
in a series of cut bands and then the rest of the barrel is round going out to a beautiful silver spider front sight. We don't have any rear sight on this swivel breech on the smooth bore barrel side. In typical gunsmith fashion, the maker has signed just forward of the touch hole here on both barrels. So both our smooth bore and our rifled barrel are signed. On the rifled barrel, the signature is set back between the touch hole and the rear sight on the barrel. Back here in our wrist, we have some simple checkering surrounded by some kind of outlet carving here, providing some design elements, meshing the lock face area with the wrist and then the butt stock as we move back. With our smooth bore barrel side up on the lock face side here, you can see our simple four stock. This four stock doesn't wrap around the underside of the barrel because we have that rifled barrel underneath, but it still features many of the same accents. So we have several barrel keys here holding the barrels together to the forestock and to the entire swiveling barrel assembly. We also have these brass extension plates. We have three of them there held on with screws. Now, because of this assembly being so complicated, I believe these screws to be more structural than uh, decorative. Rotating around here to our side plate side, we can see the forestock face on the other side. Because we don't have a wood stock underneath either of these barrels, our ramrod channel is designated to be on the side, which is interesting. So we have a little bit of a thicker forestock on this side to accommodate for this ramrod channel. Like just about any muzzleloader, we have an entry pipe and two simple ramrod pipes. These are made and filed with facets in the center with wedding bands on either end. Coming back to our entry pipe, the main face of the entry pipe moving back emulates many of the shapes that we see back here in our butt plate. It has some simple border engraving, and there are a couple dings from use over the years, which I really enjoy seeing, especially on a hunting piece like this one. Our ramrod has a black horn tip. The ramrod tip that is inside the stock currently is plain wood and does not feature any kind of cap or threading. On either side of the front of the forestock out at the nose, we do have a brass nose cap protecting the end grain of our forestock. Rotating around so we can talk about the rifled barrel, we have a nice simple rear sight and a silver blade front sight with the maker's signature here. We have a very traditional rear sight here. It's not just a dovetailed sight cut into the barrel. It has some ornate scroll elements passing forward towards the front side. As we come back to our side plate side, we have a large brass side plate mimicking the same shape that we have on the back action lock plate on the other side. It's held on with a single screw here at the back. The other half of our lock plate on either side holding the pan and the frizzen to the stop features some nice simple decorative engraving. It's not overdone, but it is the most complicated engraving that we see compared to the other items on the rest of the piece. As we come back to our cheek piece side here, we have a large pronounced cheek piece here. Very comfortable when shouldering this rifle. It features a couple carved lines here, giving it some character, but nothing too out of the ordinary. Really, the expense and the craftsmanship on this rifle is exhibited with the swivel breech action here and the functionality of this. The whole rest of the rifle combination smoothbore gun here doesn't really need to be very fancy because of the ingenuity that goes into making this kind of action work. I think it's really neat. As I mentioned, this has been reconverted back to flintlock here, but that doesn't take away from the craftsmanship, I think, of this piece. The rest of it's just neat. It's neat to see. We hear about these swivel breech guns, we read about them. It's not too often that we see them. And I think uh, as far as seeing an original swivel breech goes, this is pretty neat. I think even as we go back to the 18th century, it's hard to deny that having two shots would, uh, wouldn't be an advantage in any rate. And having the ability to shoot shot and a round ball projectile would be super handy. So I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to share this swivel breech with you here today. If you'd like to learn more about this or any of the other muzzleloaders we're talking about here today, you can check out the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages for more high quality photos and videos and educational content. I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.